Iran is bound to react, uh, whether they do so successfully in the degree of pain they inflict and uh, whom they inflict pain upon are still uncertain. The fundamental analysis of the last few months that uh, Iran, uh, Hezbollah and Lebanon, their big ally, uh, don't want to escalate the situation to a major war uh, still holds true, but the situation is volatile, dangerous. Israel is lashing out. Iran is capable of lashing out too. And many a war has begun from smaller seeds than the ones we see in the region now. On Thursday, President Joe Biden picked up the phone to um, Prime Minister um, Benjamin Netanyahu and demanded better protection of Palestinian civilians and aid workers. Now, many people are asking, why did it take the death of seven foreign aid workers for the West to take notice and finally put real pressure on Israel on its handling of the conflict? Now, um, Jose Andres from the World Central Kitchen said that his staff were attacked systematically car by car during that incident on Monday, which has really left the world uh, reeling. And of course, a number of British citizens were killed in that attack. Now, since then, Israel has apologised for what it calls the grave mistake and its military has also dismissed two officers and reprimanded three others for their role in this attack in central um, Gaza. And of course, today we have news that the IDF has managed to bring back the body of a um, hostage However, there is strong, strong feelings um, in Israel and beyond. Now, uh, this weekend is we're marking nearly six months since the Hamas attack on October the 7th. Now, the death toll continues to rise. And I guess the question that many people are pondering this weekend is, is the patience of some of Israel's greatest allies running out? And what's next? Is there an exit strategy? Um, is there likely to be a, a ceasefire? And are we just naive to talk about a two-state solution given all the pain that both sides have gone through? Now, we're going to, as I say, dedicate a huge amount of time to this um, in this story, in this um, show today. And I'm delighted that my first guest is Sir Richard Dalton. He's the former UK ambassador to Libya and Iran. And Sir Richard is also a former consul general in Jerusalem. We're delighted to have his company today. Sir Richard, welcome to the show. Thank you. What was your reaction to the attack that happened, which killed the, the seven aid workers? Does that feel to you like a, a turning point in, in this conflict? Well, you're certainly asking the right questions. And I think it's too soon to say whether it will be a turning point. But to start with, perhaps the best summary of where we are was provided by the Secretary General of the United Nations in his address marking six months of this dreadful conflict. He talked about the unbelievable destruction and suffering. He said that respect for international humanitarian law was in tatters. He spoke of over one million facing catastrophic hunger in an avoidable crisis of suffering. He spoke of collective punishments, of false narratives that thrive as no journalists are allowed into Gaza. And of course, he repeated his demand for an immediate ceasefire and immediate release of all hostages. Israel's allies may now be drawing a line <clears throat> that, as you hinted, they should have drawn months ago. But there are two big questions that one has to ask oneself about this. First, does Israel believe there is now a line? In other words, do they believe that United States support will be conditioned as declared by the United States government on immediate access of full volumes of international assistance and much more care for civilians? And secondly, the second question is, will the United States and fellow allies of Israel hold that line and proceed to condition what they do for Israel on Israel's performance. And, you know, in terms of the 
the line. Where do you think the, the line is? Well, the policy that appears to be being pursued by the United States and, and, and Britain and maybe others is, first of all, immediate ceasefire and release of hostages. And the negotiations uh, long running failed so far in Qatar, in Cairo, are resuming, involving Hamas, Egypt, Qatar and the United States. Secondly, flooding Gaza with assistance and certainly the opening of additional ways in at the Erez checkpoint in the north, Kerem Shalom, and using Ashdod port in Israel, uh, that has potential, but we don't yet know whether Israel will keep its foot on the hose pipe in the way that it has in the past and uh, delay supplies, send some back, and gen generally not provide what is needed. Uh, the third element of the policy that Israel's allies are pursuing is that there should be no wholesale action against Rafah, that mm -hmm. part of the south of the Gaza Strip where uh, 1.4 million people are sheltering. But the United States policy appears to me to be equivocal on that. They appear to be supporting the idea of continued military action by Israel there, but just that it should be done more carefully. But that policy could evolve to uh, be rather more firm, I hope it will, on saying that enough is enough, Israel should now stop. Uh, and then, of course, part of the line is that there should be a, a permanent ceasefire eventually, uh, and that a political strategy, the political strategy for Israel to find its own security through the essential political means, should finally be put in place. But that looks as though it's sometime in the future. Yes, I mean, that that final um, piece of the jigsaw, as you say, does feel uh, like it's a very, very kind of distant aspiration. And in terms of, um, I suppose, international pressure, we have definitely seen words being toughened up. I mean, David Cameron, the UK Foreign Secretary, has, has been quite tough in his language for some time. Um, we've seen a toughening up in the language from Joe Biden. And yet... Um, despite the sort of tough talking and phone calls and, you know, quite tough diplomacy, America is still sending considerable um, firepower to Israel in terms of arms. Uh, there's a big conversation now in the UK about whether the UK should be looking to, to do an, an arms embargo. We've had this letter from 600 legal experts, a number of cross-party MPs have come together um, uh, and called for, for this. What do you think is going to or should happen in terms of um, sales of arms to Israel? Because it feels to to many, probably of my listeners, and to many kind of just normal people watching this, that maybe the only way to compel some action from Israel is, is to stop arms for, for a while. That's absolutely right. And it has happened in the past when Israel has gone too far. Uh, those who supply arms... Uh, should be asking themselves, well, what has Israel achieved? And the answer is, it has achieved a immense degradation of the capabilities of Hamas as a military force uh, against a background in which even continued military action by Israel would not succeed in extirpating Hamas as an organization, as a collective aspiration of a uh, minority, but a substantial minority of the people of Gaza uh, to support armed resistance as the only way of getting their rights, uh, their rights to a state, their rights to freedom. So if you put those two together, the degree of damage and the impossibility of achieving the kind of victory which the Israeli government has declared, then if the Israelis continue on the course that they have uh, adopted for the last six months with the totally predictable consequences that we have seen, then a uh, response by the United States is absolutely called for. I mean, a majority uh, in the Democratic Party is now moving against arms supply quite correctly. The arguments are slightly different in, in Britain because what we do is very small in relation to Israel's needs, but it is a vital point that we should obey our 
own law and international law when it comes to arms supply to anybody, whether it's Israel or anybody else. And it's been plain for a long while that we are not observing either our own law or international law. Now, the government may think otherwise, and they may have received some advice over the months. And the demand from the opposition in Parliament that Parliament be allowed to do its job by being briefed, not just on what British government policy is, but on the basis for that policy, including the legal basis, that is absolutely right. And it is quite irresponsible of the government to rest on the convention that legal advice uh, is not uh, divulged to Parliament. It has been in national crises in the past, and it should be in this crisis when we are aiding and abetting the plausible evidence of genocide, which the International Court of Justice has pointed to. So we may think that Mr. Cameron's been, Lord Cameron's been a bit tougher, but it's tiny nuances. It's uh, firm language in private meetings, but it hasn't taken away the urge to support Israel until final victory, uh, which is what our actions speak to. Mm -hmm. uh, and final question to you, um, Sir Richard, you're a former UK ambassador um, to Libya and uh, Iran. How much attention should we be paying to what's going on um, in other parts of that region? For example, the Israeli uh, attack uh, in Damascus um, against Iranian commanders on, on Monday. How do you think that plays into to what's happening? Well, we'll see in the next few days. Iran is bound to react, uh, whether they do so successfully in the degree of pain they inflict and uh, whom they inflict pain upon are still uncertain. The fundamental analysis of the last few months that uh, Iran uh, Hezbollah in Lebanon, their big ally, uh, don't want to escalate the situation to a major war, uh, still holds true, but the situation is volatile, dangerous, Israel is lashing out, Iran is capable of lashing out too, and many a war has begun from smaller seeds than the ones we see in the region now. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, Richard, really, really interesting to talk to you and to get your um, insight and, and your opinion on things. Thank you very much for your time.